tonight's lecture is um, social network analysis, which uh, I think is a very popular thing right now. It's really exciting. A lot of people want to do these these visualizations of how people are connected, and um, in the research community, in many different fields, there's a lot of excitement about uh, this type of data that you can get from social networks that reveal large and broad patterns of human behavior in a way that used to be very, very difficult to collect. Uh, you used to, if you wanted to know how friendships formed, you used to have to send a researcher out into the field to survey people for, uh, you know, manually or watch them for months uh, just to you know, see who associates with who and in what way. But we can do a lot of this with computers and uh, or the data that people put online now. Uh, and so we're going to talk about what that is and how we can analyze it and, and how we can use it in journalism, which there's already been a little bit of, not too much, but we'll look at it. Uh, we're going to look at a bunch of different algorithms too, um, algorithms for trying to compute who is influential or central in a social network, and algorithms for trying to identify groups of people. And I have to say that um, they're, they're tricky to apply. But we'll we'll get there. Uh, this is a piece from the Wall Street Journal, which I'm just going to show you. It's uh, it's this story um, about uh, insider trading. Oh, look at that! It played the whole thing really fast. You can see it, it's sort of trying to to tell you how this story unfolds with various people. But I'll jump to the end. And the idea is this, you've got this, this central guy here, uh, Raj, I can't pronounce that right now, Raj Aradman, who uh, was passing information to traders in various uh, other companies. So, and eventually uh, was found guilty of insider trading. Uh, so somewhere here, let's see what it details. Somewhere, so click nodes for details. Should be showing me what each of these people did. No, okay, we're gonna reload it and see if that works. All right, well, for some reason I can't drive this right now. But it, it will tell you what each of these people did, where they worked, just this relationship between them. And it was this whole complicated case involving uh, you know, this guy at the center of it, and then passing information to people of all these other companies. So you can see the little, little square icons here are corporations, and the circles are people. Um, you know, So this person worked at Hilton, and this person worked at Google, and this person got information from the central guy, and then this one traded on it. <coughs> well, that's an interesting question, yeah. I don't think it's a browser thing. I think it's something with the way the interactive is designed. I think News Blaster may be permanently down at this point. Hmm. No, I don't know what's going on. Oh, they've updated it. Yeah, so I think they just broke it. 
So you used to be able to click on each of these and they would just tell you details of each person's involvement in the story. Okay, so there you go. Somewhere in here there's a lesson about uh, software testing and maintaining things that you put online. But this is the general idea. Now, I don't know that this is social network analysis per se. Um, I think this is more using the social network to visualize a complex story and communicate a complex story, which is great, right? We, that's, that's a wonderful technique. We should be doing that. Uh, there's the open question of when the reporters were putting together this story and trying to figure out the time and the events, because this is all reconstructed from court documents, mostly, whether they drew a picture like this, right? So you've all seen the scene in the, uh, the movie where the detective starts, you know, like pinning the names on the board and like drawing lines between them with string. That's, that's social network analysis as well, right? So that's this, this sort of, you know, draw a picture of all of the connections. So why would you bother doing that? Like what's the point of looking at the network connections between people and organizations? A lot of looking at that information would be good. Yeah, so basically for the same reason you do any visualization, right? It, it's, it allows you to understand a set of relationships much faster, potentially, if, if it's a good visualization. But there's some sort of, um, you know, there's, there's something interesting about looking at groups of people instead of individual people and looking at how they relate. Um, so let's, let's get a little more detailed on this. First of all, we're going to define the terms. So for our usage, um, we're, we're looking at these, these network objects. And we're, we're going to say there's two types of things in a network. There's nodes and edges. And this is all standard stuff. This is a, uh, in mathematics, this is called graph theory. You know, also, you know, vertices and edges or nodes and links or, you know, objects and relationships. It's, it's all the same idea, right? There's two types of things. Um, but mostly we're talking about people in this case. And a relationship is between two objects. So if I was going to say, you know, there's four of them and they all know each other really well, then rather than having four people in one relationship that says they all know each other, what I actually have is four people and six relationships. All right, so I have, a, I have this sort of thing. Yeah, so that's every, every pairwise relationship. So you're not limited by just looking at, at two. And uh, you know, we said that these nodes are people. Um, they could also be organizations or, or other types of, of entities, you know, places. Um, they could represent times, you know, you know 1993. Um, but generally, they're people or organizations. But there's a lot of different types of links. And it's a. Uh, the terminology here is not very well developed, but, but broadly speaking, you know, most of the algorithms we're going to look at today, and mostly when people talk about visualizing a social network, they mean one type of link. Very often they mean the sort of, you know, I clicked accept or I clicked follow social network type of link. But uh, there's an older word, which is link analysis, which comes originally from law enforcement. You know, that's the criminals in the string. And there you have all different types of links. And when you've got all different types of links, things get a lot more complicated. Because, you know, we're going to look at algorithms for things like, you know, what's the shortest path between two objects? Well, you know, if, if, if it's a friend of a friend of a friend relationship, but then also there was one point where they attended the same school and so they had another type of edge between them, then asking about things like distances or centrality when you have multiple different types of links doesn't really make sense. The, the algorithms sort of break down. But you can do other things, right? It might be really useful to have a link that says company A controls company B because you own a majority of shares. That, that can be a very interesting thing. Uh, and basically because there's, in real life there's a lot of different types of relationships. 
so the reason why we're looking at everyone together, it's fundamentally because humans are social. That's why we call it a social network. And they're social in a lot of different ways. I mean, the whole, the whole subject of sociology is based on the idea that when you look at how people act together, you see things that you don't see when they act individually. And there's some very basic stuff, right? So we all have these little, these little groups that we live in, these little communities, our families and friends. Every, every human has this. People who don't have such a network uh, actually very often uh, get weird. Uh, they, they get mental health problems. Humans don't do well in isolation for long periods of time. It's also, um, you know, you have no support network. If you get sick, there's nobody there to bring you soup. It's these types of problems. So humans really, really do this, along with a lot of other animals. We're going to be looking at um, dolphins later in this class. And, um, and it affects things. Um, who we interact with has other effects, right? So if we're, you know, trying to figure out who to buy something from or enter into a business deal, I mean, in theory, you could enter into some sort of business transaction with anyone. But in practice, especially if it's a big thing or a complicated thing or a lot of trust is required, you're going to much more likely to go with people that you already know or through a, a chain of introductions, right? This is totally obvious human behavior. And influence, you know, it, 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 it's kind of funny. It, it, on one level, it makes no sense. But if a stranger tells me something and a friend tells me something, I process that information differently. Right, the same thing. You know, why, why would that make a difference? But on one level, it kind of does make sense because we assume that the people we know well have our best interests at heart, rightly or wrongly. We assume this, and it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, one of the of the things I've noticed traveling is every little village will tell me that the village down the road is dangerous and I should stay away from it. Right. So apparently every village but the one that I'm currently in at that point is unsafe. Uh, but that's how, that's how humans think, right? It's like, you guys are all my friends, so you're cool, but someone I don't know, you know, that's, they're probably not trustworthy. And of course, they're over there saying the same thing about us. So this stuff matters. Um, even what we think of as acceptable behavior to a huge degree, more than really anyone realized or wanted to admit until a bunch of really famous experiments uh, in the middle of the 20th century, that right and wrong is determined by how people respond around us. Um, so you've all heard of the Stanford prison experiments. Uh, so that's a classic example. Um, the Milgram experiments, very similar idea, but much more subtle things, right? So. Um, you know, it's you know, I'm I'm uh, high school is a wonderful setting to study social relationships, right? Anyone seen a film called Mean Girls? Right. So at any point, one of those girls could have said, you know, that's not nice. Don't do that. And if enough of them say that, then that becomes the norm. But the the norms in that context were such that that type of you know the, the horrible things they did to each other were allowed because nobody said no. And this also explains, you know, various horrific episodes of human history, right? You know, I was just following orders. Well, that's not really the reason. The reason is more that everyone around, else around me was doing the same thing. So it became normal, it became accepted. There's an underlying thread to all of these things that I've written down. What is it? What's the, the, the pattern here? Bias, that's an interesting way to put it, yeah. Um, bias and perception, yeah, that, that's, that's actually good. I like that. Um, it's not just perception, though. It's real. Um, people, for example, tend to marry people of similar race, educational level, economic background. Homophily, yes, exactly. So this is a word in, uh, coined in the middle of the 20th century. Everybody know? where this word came from? So the parts of this word? So homo, the same. Philly, 
uh, liking or loving. So it's the like of the same. And this is from a nice uh, paper, which you know you can uh, you can go look at. It's got it's really interesting. It gives hundreds and hundreds of examples of homophily. It talks about homophily in race, in uh, work settings, in schools. So there was a bunch of sociological research done in the United States in the uh, 50s and 60s after the courts ordered schools to be desegregated. So, you know, black and white students went to the same school, but they didn't necessarily interact. So there was a lot of work studying that. Um, friendship, of course, uh, you know, I, you know, when uh, in the run-up to the last U.S. presidential election, I basically didn't see uh, any um, Romney supporters in my newsfeed, which is not that surprising because, um, you know, I am urban and liberal and um, so are most of my friends, and uh, you know, it, it's but it's shocking because half of the country voted the other way, right? So I would think that right, half of my uh, friends would vote the other way, but no, that's not how this works. And the the fundamental idea of homophily, well, there's it's both cause and effect, right? So it's. It's two things. One is that I will tend to spend time or want to spend time with people who are like me. The other is that the people around me will influence me to become more like them. So it is both cause and effect. And it's um, if you re if you're in a situation where you need to distinguish between the two, it can be very tricky. But if we're going to talk about analyzing social networks for journalism, this has a really interesting implication. So if we know that the people in a social network are going to be similar. What can we do with that as journalists? Suppose you're an investigative journalist. You can find connections that you don't know about already. Yeah, you can project. You can sort of project. Sort of yeah, project. you can make. You can make predictions about how to find more of some type of person. Uh, you know, so if I'm doing a story on trombone players, if I examine the friends of the trombone players, I'm more likely to find more trombone players. If I'm doing a story on you know, international criminals, uh, I can assume that they probably know other international criminals. So if I can get that data on social relationships. And this is, you know, I, I'm restating in very complicated language a very obvious thing, right? It's like every every journalist, investigative journalist knows. You know, you look for the brother, you look for the old school connection, you look for the family ties, you look for who they've worked with in the past, you look for who they were in prison with, you look for who they went to school with. Right? It's very classic stuff in that sense. But this is sort of the the underlying sociological theory. There's other things we can do with social networks. Um, I'm going to say structure relates to behavior. Uh, I said I chose that word carefully because it's both a cause and an effect. But um, so, so I kind of like this one because this is 1951. This paper is published. I love the hand-drawn little social network diagrams. One of the things I'm trying to show you is that this stuff far predates computers. People have been thinking about this for a very long time. Uh, that that social network or the homophily paper that I quoted actually it talks about Aristotle and Plato talking about this effect where you choose people like you as your friends. So, you know, people noticed this thousands of years ago and some number of hundreds of years ago we started drawing little diagrams like this. And so this experiment um, did a very interesting thing. It's based on a problem where you have five people and they're each given a card with some little symbols on it. They're not letters, they're like shapes. And there's one shape that's in common with all the cards. And they're, they have little partitions, so they can't show each other the cards, but they can write notes and pass them to each other. But they can only pass them to each other in this pattern. And if you're a computer scientist and you look at this, you analyze it as a, a network information problem. And there's, you know, it's, it's not hard to come up with solutions. And in this case, um, I think the Technically, the maximum number of steps where everybody can pass a message at each step if they want is two steps, right? So, look if you look at the one on the far right, you know. So, 
all the ones in the edges pass the one to the center. The one at the center now has complete information, sends the solution back to all the others. So in two time steps, uh, you can solve this. Humans don't do it in two steps. But if you set them up to do this, they get better. They learn how to organize to solve this problem as fast as possible. So my question to you is, what happened when you ran this experiment? So you can do it over and over again. I think they did 15 trials. You get a group of five people, and they can only talk to each other in these patterns. And they have to solve this problem. Do they all end up doing the same? Does each person end up having the same role? So think of this, this is a very simple model for an organization, a workplace. Right? And, and so the question is, these are people working together solving a job. To what extent is the job or the best way to do that job determined by their position in terms of communication network? So what, what would you expect? in terms of the differences between the, for example, the circle and the wheel. Why, why would the wheel be faster? Yeah. In fact, the wheel is faster. And in fact, they're ordered here by uh, speed of the fastest solution. Actually, they um, they all end up having about the same after speed, average speed once people get organized. But what does getting organized mean? Does the in the Y pattern does the C person end up doing the same thing as the B person? No. Why not? Yeah, so they're so first of all they're talking to more people. So that alone tells you they've got to be doing something different. In fact, what happened is that uh, in general, the way this is arranged, the C person is the one sort of in the middle in some sense. That person ended up being a sort of coordinator. That person had the most information and um, you know information was passed to them first and then generally they solved it and passed it back out. And nobody told them how to organize. It's just they said, solve this as fast as possible. And they learned that depending on their position in the network, they had a different role. So generalizing this leads in a couple of different directions. One is that uh, you might be able to learn something about what someone does and perhaps their role or their influence or their authority just by looking at the communication pattern, how they talk to other people, where they are in the organization or in another type of social network. And this is kind of interesting, right? Like I haven't told you anything about who these people are or what they were told, just how they communicate. And that has another really interesting corollary, which is if I give you an organization I give you, let's say, the email of everybody in that organization, and you can plot how they communicate. That is not necessarily going to line up with the organization chart. Right? How people, I mean, everybody who's worked in a large corporation knows this, right? How people actually get things done differs a bit from how, in theory, this place is organized. Because you have to you know, talk across departments a lot, and a lot of it's about knowing that person over there who is able to get you what you need to do your job, there is a, an organizational structure just based on communication networks that sort of overlays or cuts across the um, formal structure of the organization. And that, that's interesting, again, because say we're investigating the mafia. We, don't, we never get their formal organizing structure, right? We never see a chart which says what everybody's role is. But if we can trace enough of their contact and their communication, we can figure it out. And another thing that people do, this type of, of 
social network analysis, or more technically, link analysis, is to combine multiple types of information. So this was a story that uh, Jack Gillum at the AP did um, right at the beginning of the presidential primaries at the end of 2011, when people were just starting to do their run. Uh, and what he had is he used the Freedom of Information Act to get a list of the numbers dialed from uh, uh, Governor Perry, who's the governor of Texas, um, so he had phone numbers. Then he used a political contribution database, which says who was donating and how much, but that database also had phone numbers, so you can match those up. Then he used another list, which uh, he compiled by hand just from going through records of who was appointed by Governor Perry to get different posts. So the governor says, ah, you are now going to be in charge of energy in the state of Texas. All right, so you have names. So you're matching names to numbers to numbers that Rick Perry dialed. And you plot all this on the screen. Unfortunately, I don't have the image. But what you see is that uh, he called a bunch of people, has, you know, is in close contact with on the phone with a bunch of people who are fundraisers, and also he appointed them. So you see this pattern of, of, of uh, political power, essentially. Um, now, you know, he's also not supposed to be making campaign calls on his work phone. So it's, you know, that's, that's kind of what the story is. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a brilliant story. It's like, you know, he wasted $2 of the government's money making some phone calls. Um, but it's kind of interesting that you can trace these networks of influence from a combination of public data and uh, records that are FOIA. And I'm going to play you a little video, which is an example of this type of work. It's not social network analysis per se uh, in the traditional sense of you're plotting all of the of one type of connection for people, but it's this sort of link analysis to trace something, which uh, was in your reading, so perhaps you saw this, but I'm going to play the little video now. This is a story about companies that harvest human skin and bones and tendons and process them into medical implants. It's a booming market, giving human tissue a second life. You might say, what's wrong with that? In fact, you might know someone, like we do, who's walking around right now with a corpse tendon that repaired a busted knee. This is a legitimate industry, for the most part. These products can heal, even save lives. But I'm going to tell you two stories about how illegal tissue can feed that legal billion-dollar market. Here's the list of characters you'll be hearing about. A Florida company called RTI and its German subsidiary, Tutogen. A Ukrainian morgue named Nikolaev. A Russian coroner named Igor Aleshenko. And a formal dental surgeon from Brooklyn, now a convicted felon named Michael Mastro Marino who stole body parts, including from the corpse of the famous British commentator, Alistair Cook. One last point before we get into the guts of the story. Our team looked at more than 200 companies. We talked to everyone from industry insiders and government officials to surgeons and convicted felons. We read through thousands of court documents, regulatory reports, corporate records, and internal company memos. Using a powerful analytical software called Palantir, we analyzed data on imports, inspections, infections, and accident reports filed with the Food and Drug Administration, the U.S. agency that oversees the human tissue trade. And we tried repeatedly to talk to the company that ended up being the focus of our investigation, but executives wouldn't talk to us or respond to written questions. So here's our story. There's this company called RTI Biologics, which started out as a nonprofit division of the University of Florida. Since breaking away, it has become one of the world's largest publicly traded for profit tissue processors. As we dug into this global trade, we started to see a pattern. RTI and its German subsidiary, Tutagen, have repeatedly obtained tissue from suppliers that were later investigated for allegedly stealing human parts. First, let's go to Ukraine. This February, a few months into our research, authorities raided a morgue in the southern city of Nikolaev. We talked to investigators there. They suspect body parts were stolen from cadavers 
brought in for autopsy. They told us signatures were forged to make it seem like families had given their consent. The Ukrainian investigators said tissue might have been taken illegally from as many as half the bodies that passed through the morgue. During the raid, police seized autopsy reports written in English, lab results apparently destined for Tutagen, and bottles of human tissue labeled Tutagen, made in Germany. But one thing really caught their eye. An envelope stuffed with cash labeled N-I-K-1. That's the U.S. government's abbreviation for the Nikolai Morgue. See, the morgue was registered as a tissue bank with the FDA. What's interesting is the phone number listed for that morgue was identical to 24 other Ukrainian morgues also registered in the U.S. And what's more, when we called that number, we reached an automated system for tutagen, which makes medical implants out of human tissue. In early 2008, Tutagen merged with RTI. Remember, that's the big American for-profit tissue processor. Back in the 90s, Tutagen got its tissue from suppliers in places like Estonia, Latvia, Czech Republic, and Hungary, where tissue can be taken without consent unless a donor opts out while he's still alive. Families complained in some cases. Uh, police launched investigations, but they didn't go anywhere. We got a hold of internal records that show Tutagen has been getting tissue from Ukraine for more than a decade and supplying RTI. The company appears to work through a middleman there, a Russian coroner named Igor Aleshenko. Until the raid in February, Aleshenko was director of BioImplant, a company owned by the Ukrainian Ministry of Health, which collected the tissue from regional morgues to send to Tutagen. Internal records show Tutagen had real problems doing business with Aleshenko. In a 2002 memo marked strictly confidential with four exclamation points, Tutagen executives urged an exit strategy from Ukraine. They wrote that a middleman, believed to be Aleshenko, kept demanding more money, and they didn't know what happened to the money they sent him to pay the morgues. Despite these misgivings, Tutagen didn't pull out of Ukraine. Instead, the company expanded its regional network. Over the years, Ukrainian authorities have investigated two other morgues that supply Tutagen for allegedly stealing tissue, bullying families, and forging consents. No one has ever been convicted. As for Aleshenko, local news reports say he left Ukraine following the February raid. Neither police nor health officials will tell us where he went. So where are we today? RTI doesn't import its Ukrainian tissue through Germany anymore. The Ukrainian tissue bank BioImplant is exporting directly to the United States. But foreign tissue is still a small part of RTI's supply chain. Like other big players in the industry, RTI actually gets most of its tissue in the U.S. But U.S. law hasn't kept up with this rapidly evolving industry. And that brings us to our second story. Here at home, RTI operates a nonprofit called RTI Donor Services, which directly recovers tissue from American cadavers. RTI has also contracted with tissue banks in 23 states. One of those suppliers was New Jersey-based Biomedical Tissue Services. It was run by a former dental surgeon from Brooklyn, Michael Mastro Marino. RTI started working with Mastro Marino in 2002, but got nervous when staff complained that he was verbally abusive and had ties to organized crime. So RTI hired a law firm to run a background check. And here's what the firm advised. The good doctor has been on Santa's naughty list for quite some time. I would strongly encourage you not to do business with someone that has this kind of resume. Instead, RTI drew up a new contract with Biomedical Tissue Services. In place of Mastro Marino's name was that of his newly licensed off-site medical director. RTI continued to work with the company and Mastro Marino as their main contact until 2005. That's when the company found out what he had really been up to for the last three years. From funeral homes in the Northeast, Mastro Marino stole body parts, some infected with cancer, hepatitis, or HIV, from more than 1,000 corpses. One source of tissue was the body of Alistair Cook, that famous British broadcaster and host of Masterpiece Theater. He died at 95 of lung cancer, but his death certificate was altered and then his cancer-ridden tissue was sold for $11,000. 
There were massive recalls. Five companies pulled back a total of 25,000 products made from the human tissue Mastro Marino supplied. And police got on his case. He's now serving time at a maximum security prison after pleading guilty to conspiracy and body theft. And the families of his victims filed a lawsuit against RTI alleging negligence. That case goes to trial this October in New York. When we started looking through court files and started talking to people, we realized that neither companies nor the FDA had ever tried to verify whether consent was actually given. No one cross-checked the files until after the industry was alerted to a pending criminal investigation. So what's the bottom line here? Why should we care? Well, you should care because regulations are ineffective. Given the enormous profits that can be made in the industry, it's shockingly easy to get into. Just fill out a one-page form on the FDA website and you're in business, according to those who have done it. You can harvest tissue yourself. You can distribute it on the open market. You don't even have to be inspected. In fact, according to our analysis of FDA data, only about 40% of tissue banks in operation today show any record of being inspected by the agency. So why do we need this fancy software to figure out the story? Well, you can see how complicated all the networks can be. These companies and their operations stitch an intricate network across the globe. But those connections are buried in paperwork and data sets. Ultimately, we uploaded more than one million companies, people, document, and events into the system. So to sum up, the human tissue trade is a perfect example of demand outstripping regulation. It's not surprising that some unscrupulous characters sensing massive profits may have latched on to an otherwise legitimate industry. And that's a fact the FDA and Congress have overlooked. Right, who can who follow with that? Yeah. So a lot of moving parts to that story. Uh, what they showed us was tracing one particular network of suppliers and people involved, right? So you have the, um, the Ukrainian uh, morgues, you have uh, this guy, Alashenko, who's the middleman there selling to Trudogen, which is then importing to RTI. Uh, you've got uh, this thing about all of these morgues have the same phone number listed on their paperwork, which actually calls to RTI, or actually calls to uh, Tutagen. Um, if you just have thousands of documents and there's these phone numbers scattered in there, you're not going to see it. So what the software was used for in this case is basically just visualization. It's this, uh, when you plot the connections between a whole bunch of things, you see patterns like, let me find the particular slide here. There's one that had, I yeah, so this sort of pattern you? where you have a central item with a lot of things around it, that's what you would see for those phone numbers, right? If you had a, um, the phone number, like the actual number as an entity. And then you had every document that contained that number as a node as well. Then what you would see is a central phone number and this sort of rosette of documents around it. So part of the value here is that these, these types of patterns become a lot more clear. Now this isn't anything you couldn't have done with uh, the right type of query, right? You could say, you know, give me a, you know, count how many times each phone number appears and give me a list of the top phone numbers and what documents they're in. Uh, or you could say something like, uh, you know, for this, for our example uh, earlier for, for this story, right, you, it's a, it's a, it's a join in SQL. Can I make you go away? There we go. Uh, you know, so select phone numbers, join them against the phone numbers in the political records, give me all the names. And now you have all the names of the people who are called. So there's nothing conceptually difficult about that. The difficulty is you're not going to think to do that. Whereas if you have uh, the 
case where all of those Ukrainian morgues had the same listed phone number, what you're going to get when you visualize it is a pattern which looks like this. Maybe the marker that's working. There we go. So there's the phone number. Here's all of these individual organizations, right? All of these morgues. And, but then on the other side, what you're going to see is if you make the Ukraine also uh, an entity, you're going to see a pattern like this. And when you lay this out in visualization, even if it's just like a little tiny corner, of some huge graph with all this stuff in it, you're going to see this. This type of pattern means that all of these objects in the middle have those two things in common. So it's this sort of rapid visual analysis of the connections between things, uh, which is considerably more sophisticated than just, you know, I'm going to plot a network of, of people. So here's, here's where I think social network analysis and its sort of more sophisticated cousin link analysis can be useful in journalism. The first is to find people or groups of people. So using this idea of homophily, um, you know, I can sort of look at everybody who's talking to each other and then say, well, who else are they talking to? And I bet that person's going to be similar. Or some analysis we're going to look at uh, using these ideas that your communication pattern determines your role. You can ask questions like, well, who's the boss among all of these people? Right? Who's coordinating everything? And you get certain answers, right? This guy, uh, uh, Alishenko, rose to the top in that analysis. Or you can even do things like, uh, you know, this is a story about the uh, Indian community in Hong Kong. I wonder if I can start with a few Indian people and do a network analysis to find lots more and then try to target them with my story, try to promote it to them. So marketers do this all the time, right? They're trying to break people down by demographics and interests. And of course, there's the Facebook graph search that just came out, which is trying to attempt this as well. And then you can look at these patterns, you know, all of this, this complicated stuff in terms of suppliers and things. Sometimes uh, this sort of long chains become very interesting. And uh, you can also watch how information spreads. We saw an example of that with the social flow visualization of, of Bin Laden. And by and large, journalism doesn't really do a lot of this yet. But uh, as we start to ask questions about what is the effect of our journalism and who's seeing it, both for economic purposes, that is to say because promoting our journalism and our brand makes money, and for uh, journalism reasons, that is to say, the point of this journalism was to affect society in some way. So who did it affect? Who saw it and did things change? Or just as uh, illustrations. And do any of you remember the, I think it was like the third or fourth slide, it was the first thing we did in this course. We talked about the different areas where computer science can apply to journalism. bring up that slide again at some point. Maybe at the end of the course I'll bring it up and I'll be like, see? <laughs> we covered all of them. In this case, it, it applies to every area, right? So you could do an analysis, a social network analysis, that doesn't end up with a visualization in the story. It just helps you uncover the story. Or like the Galleon's web thing, maybe they didn't use it to do the reporting, but it was a way to communicate it. And you can even use it in, in filtering because uh, you can look at centrality measures and interpret them as influence measures. And so if I start asking questions like, you know, I, I need an expert on the subject of uh, wooden shipbuilding. One way I can do that is I can try to find everybody who's ever tweeted about wooden ships and see who they follow in common. That's a, you know, a very simple way to, to find answers. And th that, uh, I sent you all a link today about a startup which aims to do exactly this, although in a little more sophisticated way because it finds some people and it asks you, do you mean this? But it starts with this idea of seed accounts and then looks at the social connections. Who read the first 
uh, reading, which was that old manual for how to go into a town and figure out who's in charge. I saw that. Is that at all interesting? <laughs> okay, I think that's a no face. <laughs> all right, well, fair enough. Um, I included that because I wanted to, I think one of the problems with the algorithms that I'm about to show you is that generally they're studied by computer scientists or statisticians or mathematicians who have a real disconnect from the idea of what influence actually is in social settings. And so I wanted to try to get you thinking about what does influence look like on the ground, right? Not in this abstracted world of nodes and edges, but in the real world of people who have authority or power, and wh what does that even mean? Wh what does it mean for someone to be influential? You want to try a definition? Yes, everyone has edges. No, not, not in a network, oh. in, in reality. When I say that someone's influential, what do I mean? Somebody An authority on a subject, but that's kind of getting circular, right? So what's an authority? A person who's prestigious. Okay, so there's there's something there about affecting other people. Um, and I, what's that? Shapes the view of other people. Yeah. Yeah, there's something in this concept about if someone who's influential decides something or says something, other people believe it or do what they say, something like this. And we can see this. This is very clear in human society, right? There's, there's status, right? There are, in, in any given dimension, there's sort of people at the top and people at the bottom. And uh, sometimes it's formal. Uh, you know, has, we have titles and offices, but you know, being the president isn't just about having the name on the door that says president. It, uh, I'm sure you can all think of examples where the person who was the uh, titular head of something wasn't actually the person in charge. So that's it's not actually what it is, although probably that helps if you've got a, a title, right? So uh, that booklet talked about going into a town and, and simply asking people, you know, who, who's in charge around here? Who do you trust? Who's influential? And it, what I liked about it is it gets at this idea that uh, it's about what a lot of other people think. Right? So if I'm influential, it's not really about what I think. It's about what all of you think. So there's a desire when you have all of this data on who's communicating. We have all this data, right? We know who's, well, I'm using we very broadly. The data exists. Who has a right to access the data is, is a whole other question and gets into notions of privacy and, and the power that derives from data access and all of this surveillance, all of this stuff. But in general, the data exists somewhere, right? All of these people communicating, all the emails, all the tweets, all the Weibo, and then, um, you know, who follows who, the friendship graph, who buys what. You know, you can look at the data, you know, if, if this person bought something, do all these people buy something, all right? And again, if you want to study social networks, go back to high school, right? It's like, you know, the popular kids start wearing Adidas and then everyone else starts wearing Adidas, right? It's, or whatever it was, like I remember we had, there were toys, there was music that everybody listened to. Musical taste is a great example. There are people who are influential in musical taste. And so you could, in theory, predict that, oh look, all of this person's friends started listening to this band. This person is gonna listen to that band too. Uh, which starts to get very interesting if you're trying to sell people things. You know, there's a, there's a great quote 
about data science. The greatest minds of my generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click on ads, and that sucks. A as you continue your journey through algorithmic analysis of data and algorithmic analysis of social networks, and many, many of the techniques that we, we are looking at in this course have crossover into many fields, you will discover that 95% of the time, if not more, the reason the technique is being applied is to sell something to someone. You know, which is okay, um, but uh, I think boring. Anyway, centrality algorithms. This is what we want. We want to know who's in charge. We want to know who's influential. We want to know who's powerful. We want to know who the boss is. We want to know who's the brains of the operation. We want to know uh, who we need to talk to if we want something to change. We, you know, and again not necessarily the same thing as the person with the name on the door. Or we may not have that visibility if it's, if it's you know, a criminal organization or a criminal operation or it's otherwise secret from us. Insider trading, finance and banking in general, very secretive. So if we're trying to do a story on insider trading, we have a real problem because we can't just you know, go to the open data portal and look up the name of the person who leads the insider trading ring. Um, the argument that I'm making is that from the shape of the network, we can determine who is influential. And it's pretty much what you would think. So who's the most influential person in these graphs? C, yeah. And You decided that by eyeballing it, uh, but there is, no, you didn't decide it by eyeballing it? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's a really good point, right? What, so this gets into the question of what's an edge, right? And one of the problems with this type of analysis is that you're taking some complicated relationship in the real world, you know, C went to school with D, and you're quantizing it. You're, you're, you know, it's like you have to fit it into a drop down that says brother of, did business with, went to school with. Okay, went to school with. That doesn't tell you anything about the strength of the connection necessarily. So it's a good observation. But assuming all of the connections are equal strengths, the structure tells you something. The situation here is very similar to what we had with clustering. So you remember the first class, yeah, first class, we did um, the visualization of the voting patterns in the House of Lords. And we saw these blocks. And, and what I mean by that is we saw these blocks. We used our eyes and we said, oh, there's a group of dots over there. So we can do that with social networks. We can look at this plot and say, like I'm talking about, right, a visual pattern. That's what visualization is. It's turning data into patterns that we can see with our eyes. So that's one way. The other way, we talked about clustering algorithms, where we made the computer give us a list of which politicians were in each block. And that's where we got that list of one, two, three, four, five. And then we talked about hierarchical clustering algorithms and all those sort of things. Situation is very analogous here. I'm just going to, um, well, we're going to go through both of them. This is something that everybody should understand at least a little of. This is a. Uh, this is the algorithm that's used to draw almost every hairball that you see. Everyone know what I mean by a hairball? Um, let's see if Google Images does this. There you go, hairballs. Right? We've seen a ton of these. It's one of these plots with like a million, million little points. There's another one. We've, all, we've seen a bunch of them. Um, hairballs. So how you draw a hairball is you, um, one of the reasons they're called hairballs is because they're not actually very useful in most cases. Um, I, I, I gave a whole talk which was like, stop drawing hairballs. But um, useful sometimes, especially if the graph is smaller 
or you, you're able to zoom in on it for select nodes. And the problem is this. Um, let me show you some data. Uh, I'm actually going to go to the assignment, which you will look at at the end of this. And this is a source data file for um, the relationships between characters in uh, Les Miserables. And what we have is, you know, this is a list of nodes. And then when we get through the list of nodes, each of which is a character in the book, we have a list of edges, which gives two people and a weight. Great. So that's the, the source data. That's what the data looks like. We want to turn that into a picture. So to turn it into a picture, um, we have to decide on a position for each person. We have to, to come up with an XY coordinate for each dot on the screen uh, to plot it. So that's what a layout algorithm is. And the classic layout algorithm is we, we start with all of the dots in some random position, like literally random. We just, we, you know, we take a square on the screen and we put each one in random and we draw the edges between them. And then we try to sort them out. And what we do is we pretend that there's a spring between every two of them, every pair of them. So that uh, this little, these little blue arrows pointing in, you can imagine that as a spring that wants to be a certain length. Right? And that um, the length of that spring corresponds to the weight between the nodes. So if the weight corresponds to, say, they're friends on Facebook, and the weight corresponds to how often, you know, how many messages they've sent back and forth last week, if I have a greater weight, do I want that, that length to be closer or farther? So if I have two people and they send a lot of messages, do I want them to be closer or farther than two people who don't send very messages, very many? Closer, yeah. So generally, what you do is you set the length of that spring to be shorter when the weight is higher, so inversely proportional. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to make people have a close relationship if you're close in space. And then the other thing that you want to do is well, if there was just this force pulling them all together, then all that would happen is all of the dots would go zip into this little clump in the middle and you wouldn't see anything. So there's a balancing force, which is a global repulsive force. Every dot tries to push away every other dot. And that spread things out, right? So, you know, if you have a, a graph that's sort of got two, two parts to it, Sort of a bow tie looking thing, right? You want one on the end, on one on one side, and uh, sort of the others on the other side. And if you don't have this repulsive force, then nodes which have no connection to each other, like this one and this one, they'll end up right next to each other sometimes. So they try to spread out as much as possible, but then are pulled together by the edges, which are shorter when the weight is higher. And I can actually do this. Uh, I'm going to um, open up this file, this data file that we're looking at right now. And uh, it, I'll run it for you. And so there it is, and I'll take this layout. So force atlas and force atlas, force atlas two are this force direct algorithm. So uh, watch, because it'll go fast, but you'll see it. Actually, maybe I can slow it down. There we go. So I've made it 10 times slower. So see how it sort of pulled everything together there? And then it's still sort of spreading out a little bit, because what's happening is this node is being pushed away by every other node. So that's that's uh, force directed graph, and that's basically how people lay out graphs, and it's an algorithm.
And if you do this, you can sort of get to see the structure of the graph. So here you go. There's, there's method the first for determining centrality is uh, eyeball it. So who do you who do you think is uh, an important character? So what this is is each of these nodes is a character in the story of the nodes. So who's who's familiar with this story? It was also a movie just came out. Musical, famous. It's a French novel, originally. All right. A fair number of you have seen this or heard of it, at least. So which node would you think is a main character in this story? Yeah, so this one. So that one is Valjean. Yeah, Jean Valjean. Makes sense? Match your intuitions? Good. Um, the assignment is going to be to load this up and run a bunch of centrality algorithms on it. You don't. This is an assignment where you, where you don't have to write any code or even pseudocode. You just have to load it up and try some things. All right, so eyeball it. Method the first. Visualize it, eyeball it. But we're also going to talk about how to compute this as a number, which is really useful when the, when the graphs start getting large. Right? If I have a few hundred nodes, I can draw it. If, I have, if I'm starting to get into millions, you know, I'm doing like uh, campaign finance databases, or I'm doing phone calls, or I'm doing like the entire Twitter network, or like Weibo social network or something, where it's very awkward to work with something that size. Or maybe it's got multiple centers, right? This has kind of only got one center, this graph we looked at. But real graphs are going to have like multiple clusters and different centers. Or maybe I want some sort of automated algorithm. Um, then I can start looking at uh, computing centrality. Simplest possible centrality measure. Who has the most friends? So the, the, one of the readings was this paper by Borgatti called uh, Centrality and Network Flow. And the reason I assigned you that paper is I wanted, that, that paper more than any other I've seen gets into how to interpret centrality metrics and what the assumptions are behind them. Because it's all, it's great that we can count the number of edges coming out of a node, but what does that mean? So what does it mean? What's a situation in which the number of edges is an interesting thing to count? Anyone? What's the question? The question is, what is a situation where the number of edges is something you want to count, or you care about the number of edges coming out of a node? So a node is going to be something, an edge is going to be something, and we're going to say, you know, find me all of the nodes with high number of edges. That's a situation that exists. Yeah, so, so generally for these algorithms, all of the edges are of the same type, although they may be of different weights. Uh, but it's more about, okay, I'm going to run an algorithm that counts the number of edges on each node. Why? Why do I care about that number? What could it possibly be? Your what? Possibly. I mean, it, it depends very much, but... For example, the celebrity thing, right? So, you know, um, a celebrity with a thousand fans uh, is not as good with a, as a celebrity with a million fans. So if you want to ask who is a celebrity in any culture, uh, then uh, looking at the number of people who they can talk to at once is interesting. I remember we last time last class we looked at uh, the the distributions of the number of followers on Twitter and we saw that you know a, a very small number of people start to get into hundreds of thousands and millions of followers. That's what we were doing. Implicitly in that analysis was that having many edges is makes you important or special in some way. How else can we compute? Which nodes are central? So first of all, how, how does this fail? Like, so give me an example where 
counting the number of edges doesn't really tell us what we want to know. Right. So the important people might only talk to their, you know, one or two special assistants, for example. Or maybe celebrity is not interesting. Right. Maybe the, um, you know, uh, you know, Justin Bieber has more followers than Obama. You know, so that's not counting quite. It's not the right thing somehow. So how can we, what's another way we can measure the, the centralness or the influence of a node by looking at the structure? Second degree, how, how many, how many epigrams go to the Yeah, so this is this idea of how far you have to go to reach other people. So when is that an interesting thing to ask? So let, let's say your job depends on knowing things before other people. Let's say your job is a journalist, and your job is to know things before other people. What you're interested in then is how long it takes information to reach you, starting from different parts of your network. So you don't actually care how many people you follow, because, in fact, if you follow too many, you get overwhelmed and it's noise. What you care about is, are you generally going to be among the first to know? And so one of the ways you can ask that question numerically is to count the average distance between you and any other person. Remember we saw that last week as well, that if you t we had this graph which was if you have two random nodes, what's the average distance between them? Well, in this case, we're going to talk about an individual node because all of these algorithms compute a centrality value for each node independently and ask, what is the average number of steps I have to go to reach all of the other nodes in this network? That is called closeness centrality. So in this case, this node here, uh, I have to go through quite a lot of steps to reach the rest of the graph. But this one, the average number of steps is a lot lower. So this denominator 7 is how many other nodes other than me. And the numerator is the sum of the lengths of the paths, right? So 12 is, well, let's see. 1 to reach here, 2 to reach there, 3 to be rare, so that's 6. 1 to reach there, 7, 2 to reach, or 1 to reach there, 8, 9, 2 to reach there, 10, and I guess I'm counting differently than they are. I'm doing it wrong. Anyway, um, whereas this person has like three extra steps just to get to the middle of the graph. So this is the right, so these different metrics count different things. You want to make sure you're counting the right one. Does everyone know what I mean by saying models? What's a, what does it mean to say when I have a, a, a model of something? In this case, think of a, I have a mathematical model of something. Choice. Yeah, it's something about representation. In particular, so if I have a, a model of a car, it's not a real car, right? It's a small car. The idea of a mathematical model, uh, or really any kind of model, uh, uh, a, a, a thought model, more generally, let's say, is that it's not the real thing, but it's representing something else. So this idea of counting up the shortest paths, what I'm doing there is I'm saying, OK, well, I'm going to model the idea of influence by how long it takes to reach, to reach the rest of the graph. So 
if this idea of time taken to reach every other node is a good model of the thing that I care about, then this is the right formula. So with this algorithm, as with all algorithms, you're operating on an abstract representation of the world. And so you have to ask yourself, is the way I've represented the world, does it match what I care about? Is it a good model? There's no such thing as a good model or bad model in a, in, uh, in a vacuum. It's only, does it look at the thing I care about right now? And so um, an example in which, in which this distance thing, this closeness is a good model is, as I said, who, who gets the gossip first. What is a case uh, where this isn't going to model the right thing? Maybe I hear about gossip, but can you think of an example where I hear about lots of gossip, but I have actual no actual power? Well, yeah, that's just it, right? Actual power. So let's say uh, decision-making authority. When it's not an equal relationship? Yeah, exactly. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's not symmetric, right? Maybe, um, you know, all these arrows go both ways. So that's another really interesting question. We've been dealing with undirected graphs, right? But maybe in reality, I'm a telephone operator and I hear the calls, but I can't say anything. Um, or maybe I'm close to the center of the network. You know, maybe I, I'm friends with just this one person, so I've got a close distance, but they're the ones that know everything, right? So that's like, okay, so here's a good example. My friend is really popular, and we go out all over town, and we go to parties, but, but they're the popular one, and so everybody knows them. And because I hang out with them, I hear about all the good parties, but I don't actually, I'm not actually the one who gets invited. <laughs> I know, isn't that sad? This is su suddenly a psychotherapy session. Um, but there's an example of, you know, having the information is not really what you're looking at. There are cases where you're more interested in the control of the information flow. So uh, this is a different me metric called betweenness. And this is, so I'm still looking at shortest paths of information flow. But now I'm looking at how many of those shortest paths do I sit on? And one case that this applies to potentially is the ability to make introductions. So this is a family of the, um, or a, a graph of the family relationships in uh, Renaissance Florence. And so there's a lot of intermarriage, and so a line means that they had this intermarriage. And the family ties were also business ties. So if I'm a Pazzi and I want to do business with the Bisheri, I have to get my friend the Salviati to introduce me to Medici, to introduce me to the Turnabon, to introduce me to Agni, to introduce me to Bisheri, or possibly this direction. Right, this is the sort of uh, friend of a friend type thing, right? And if I'm on a lot of those friend of a friend paths, I have a lot of control. I can decide to forward the quest or not. I can make the introductions if I feel it's productive for me. This is a little bit different than finding out because um, take this person, right? Because they're close to the center, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. That's too many vowels. Um, there we go, Barbadori. Bar or, well, no, this person's better. They're close to the center, so they're not, they're going to have a fairly high closest centrality because they're not far off from being the first to know because they get a lot of information, right? So this is this thing where, uh, you know, Medici is the popular one and this is the friend who gets dragged along. 
but they can't make the introductions themselves, and they're not actually on the pod. So whether or not this is a good model depends upon where whether you care about information flowing through you. This is also, uh, you know, if these are not people, if these are post offices, right, it's, or or computers on the internet that are routing traffic, telephone exchanges, this is the one you want to blow up if you want to disrupt the most amount of communication. Just so you know. Um, yeah. But this not this doesn't mark in all cases as well. So what 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 would be a case where um, a person who isn't on many of the communication paths is still really influential. Right? So this is modeling information going through me or or our introductions going via me or or transactions going through me. If I'm if I make my my living processing payments, I want to be on as many of those chains as possible, right? If these are supply chains, I want to be on as many people's supply chains as possible if I'm a shipping company, because that's then I have a lot of power. But uh, let's look at this situation where you know you're the mob boss and you only talk to your two lieutenants. So you know not a lot flows through you, and yet you're still really important. So here's the uh, most complicated one. Who here is familiar with PageRank, the original PageRank algorithm that's based on a random walk on a graph? So the basic idea of that algorithm and this one was you start in a random place, and you go to one other node in each time step according to the weights on the edges, and then you repeat. And so you walk around through this graph, and over time, what you find is that you end up in certain nodes more often than others. So the idea here is it's not how many paths go through me, it's not the number of connections I have, it's not how close I am to the rest of the network, it's how well connected I am to people who are also well connected. So what you find is uh, and, and this is how PageRank worked um, by following links originally. It was, uh, you know, it wasn't the page that had the most links pointing to it. It was the page that had links pointing to it from pages who also had links pointing to it. So it's this sort of recursive thing. And you can compute it with a mathematical operation called an eigenvector. Um, which, as I said earlier, always kind of scared me, but I can do it if I try. This one is pretty good at solving these sorts of, you know, the the boss is has a small number of connections and is a little bit isolated but still very influential because what you find is that your two mob lieutenants, they're the ones with very high closeness or betweenness, right? So they um, they're in contact with everyone else because they've got to execute commands and tell everybody what the orders are. And the boss is a little bit removed, but the boss is connected to everybody else who's powerful, right? The boss is at the center of the powerful people. And so this is really good at uh, working that out. In fact, the boss might be sort of a dead end. So in terms of straight up information flow, you get a situation where um, the boss at the top here is sort of sidelined. You know, these people go out to all of these other nodes, and in terms of, you know, closeness or centrality, really you're flowing through these nodes, right? These these nodes have much high close, much higher closeness centrality, but there is no other node that is closely connected to so many other nodes that are also well connected. So this gets the highest eigenvector centrality, whereas these get the highest betweenness or closeness centrality. So that's what it looks at. So which one should you use? 
these four ways of calculating the importance or the influence of a node. Yeah. Depends what you want to know. Uh, you will find that they are quite similar in most cases. And in fact, the assignment, you're going to compare three of them. You're going to compare betweenness, degree, and closeness on the Lemiz data set and tell me what you see. So that's this other idea, right? So well, I'm, I'm going to call it journalism centrality. Now, this, there isn't an algorithm for journalism centrality, but it's this idea that for a particular story or a piece of research, somebody is going to be more important. And you're going to have to pick a centrality algorithm, assuming you're not just going to eyeball it, which is perfectly fine. But when you start to get into the millions, you can't eyeball it anymore. Uh, you have to pick an algorithm which matches the type of influence that you're interested in. And probably what you want to do is you want to try a couple different ones, see if they give you the same answers. Often what you're going to find is, uh, well, I won't spoil it. You can do the assignment and see what you find. I am not aware of a case where centrality metrics were used in a journalistic context. If you read a book on social network analysis, they will tell you all of these algorithms and a bunch more, a few of which we'll look at tonight. And because, because they're all written by people who studied graph theory. And um, that's wonderful, but uh, I actually don't know of anybody who's done it yet. So um, let me know if you use them. What about the Yeah, the one that didn't run, run properly. Well, I mean, that one, you know, they didn't, they didn't figure out that this guy Raj was important to the case by running a, a centrality algorithm on this graph. They figured out that he was important to the case because he was the one who was found guilty and uh, passing all the information to everyone else. All right, so a lot of time you know. Now, what might be interesting is, okay, so how many of you are familiar with, uh, I'm going to bet the answer is going to be not many because it's complicated and, and very US specific, but the, the whole PAC and super PAC thing for um, political advertising in the US. In brief, um, two years ago there was a ruling by the Supreme Court that uh, corporations can uh, pay for political advertising uh, which kind of dismantled the previous system where corporations could only donate fixed amounts to campaigns, meaning effectively that an unlimited amount of corporate money can flow into political advertising now in the US. Uh, but there's laws still say that it has to be independent of the campaign, which is kind of like haha, -ha, because when you do these social network analysis, you find out that the people running the, the super PACs, so PAC is political action committee, super PAC is this slightly different legal kind, um, have very close ties to the campaigns. Like normally it's like former staff who goes out and starts one. And, you know, if you could ever prove that they're communicating and coordinating, uh, you know, we'll buy ads in Iowa, you buy ads in Nevada, um, that would be illegal and that would be a story. So actually, a lot of people were doing social network analysis in the American campaign to try to understand the relationship. And generally, you can't prove that you're communicating. All you can show is that it's people who used to work together who now work in different places. But there's also rules about when you have to disclose. And some types of organizations have to disclose the donors, and some don't. So tracing where the money is coming from and who is paying for it and why is pretty complicated. And there's, there's literally millions of people and entities. So that's a situation where uh, between this centrality might give you an interesting answer because it might tell you. So you get you download this database from the FEC, right? Let me let me show you what this stuff looks like.
Oh boy. Okay, here we go. This might be huge. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So we're not going to look at that. It's 138 megabytes CSV. Uh, and it's millions of records of individual donations. And then there's another one, which is like committees, which is organizations. And then it's this complicated multiple table structure. And you load this all into your MySQL database or your Postgres, and you now have 20 million rows. And you're like, OK, now I'm going to find a story. Well, one thing you can try is you could try, well, I mean, so first of all, you do the obvious things, right? You, you, you take a look at the ones you know are spending money, right? So you say, okay, well, first just show me a list of who's spent the most money. You know, give me the top 20 donors, which is what most of the stories were involved. I would like to see an analysis with a centrality metric uh, to try to answer the question, who is funneling money through, right? So very often you have a record, A paid money to B, B paid money to C. You're trying to look for these things that are sending money through in various ways. It might work. Uh, it's not clear to me whether there's enough data to do that. But that is a potential application. Basically, I think there only makes sense when the data is relatively complete and quite large. So too big to visualize, but also <coughs> complete enough that you have a hope of tracing these, these long paths and centrality means something. Because if the graph is broken into a lot of little pieces, then centrality doesn't mean much. How much more have we got here? Uh, yeah. This seems like a fine moment to take a break. So uh, I'll uh, we'll pick up in uh, 15 minutes. What we've been talking about with centrality is, and also just eyeballing stuff, is finding particular individuals. What we might want to do is find a group of people as well. So that's the problem of locating a community uh, rather than locating a particular person or using these. Because that's what centrality measures are doing, right? They, they assign a score to each node, and then typically we're interested in the nodes that have the highest score because uh, they mean something to us. Um, community is one of these overloaded words, right? It's almost as overloaded as power or influence. It's got all these different meanings, right? So if I say, you know, um, you know, this community has seen crime rates double, uh, normally what I actually mean is a town or a city. Uh, if I say um, the, you know, HIV spread rapidly through the gay community in the 1980s, what I mean is a particular type of person rather than a particular place. I could also talk about a professional community, or the, um, you know, the journalism community, or the, um, you know, it's got all of these different meanings. But we're gonna, we're gonna sort of define it very loosely as as very, any sort of collective behavior. Any time I can look at, uh, well, I mean, really, the only thing we can look at is the, the data that we collect. But any time that we've collected some data and we can look at it and say, oh, these people are, are moving together in some way then we're going to call that a community. Very loose definition. And normally, when we do social network analysis, what we're looking for is clumps in the graph. right? So these hairballs that we see, often you see more than one big hairball. And we're interested in finding those. There's many, many more ways to define this than you might imagine. So this is the obvious one, this is the friends followers. This is actually my. Uh, Facebook friends graph and so you can see well, you know privacy issues right I didn't want to show someone else's you can see that sort of these clumps this is again the standard force directed layout is how we, we place the nodes and this this little Facebook app has tried to sort of isolate the communities for me right so these pink circles that's the result of the community detection algorithm that they've run and I think it's you know, it's pretty reasonable. I think you could make an argument that you know maybe that's something or that's something, but by and large, it's sort of a it finds the right clumps. And I don't remember anymore, and I can't see their faces, but I remember when I first looked at this, I could tell you who these people were and who these people were. In fact, I think this is people I met more around my, my time in San Francisco, and I think this is all Hong Kong people. So, so there's that the relationships is just. 
Yeah, so these these are literally all of my friends, and those are the relationships between my friends. Right, so you're not in here. No, I'm, I'm not in this picture. If I was, I'd be one node that was connected to every other node. Yeah. Which is kind of no information. But there's lots of other ways we can define it, right? We can talk, you know, depending on how we set up the nodes and edges. We saw this picture uh, a couple classes ago with... Um, this is the book sales. And so you can see that, that the, the, the books sort of clump. And what's actually happening is actually it's, it's not the books that are clumping together, it's the people. You know, the people are buying the blue books or the red books, but not both. Although actually there's kind of three, right? Because there's this other component here, which they, by looking at the content of the books, they've said, well, those are, are books that, that Democrats like to read. But I'm kind of curious why this should be a separate clump from this. It may actually be a slightly different group of people. Uh, we might be able to determine that by looking at the content of the books a little more closely. Or it could just be that there's some sort of threshold below which Amazon doesn't put a buy recommendation and there's actually some weaker links between these two clusters. So you can look at purchasing data or more generally, I call it co-consumption data. So, um, you know, if I read this article and that article, or I watched this movie and that movie, it's the exactly the data that generates the user item recommendations that we talked about last time. You can use that to pull out clumps of people, um, because when you find that two items have a very strong correlation, you draw an edge between them, and then you get these these clusters. Or we can look at communications networks. We've talked a lot about how communication shapes your role in. Uh, a structure. Anyone remember Enron? Yeah, so Enron was this American energy trading company that turned out to have been, you know, it looked like on paper it was worth billions, but it was actually bankrupt, and the auditors uh, missed it, so that took down the auditing firm, and it was this whole scandal in the early 2000s. As part of that investigation, uh, the uh, federal prosecutors obtained emails from a lot of people in the, in the company. So several hundred people, 500,000 emails or so, which they eventually made public. And so you can download these emails, and this is the communications network uh, between all these people. And you can see there's this structure immediately, right? So the, these, all of these people sort of talk to one another, and then all of these people, and here's sort of a, a, a bloom too. And then there's sort of this center here, and I think, I think that probably says Kenneth Lay, who was the CEO at the time. But you can, um, you can look at this and kind of figure out what's going on. Or you could do this with um, tweets to each other. So on Twitter, you've got at least two different ways of defining the networks. You can look at the following graph, the follower graph, and that will give you one structure. Or you can look at who actually talks to each other. So I might follow a thousand people, but I don't at message more than a small number of them. And those are going to be different graphs. Or you can look at link structure. So we saw this one before. This is the what the Persian language blogosphere looks like. Uh, and in fact, I just found the other day there is a map of the whole internet. Well, not the whole internet. Every site on the internet above a certain size. It's this zoomable map. I'll show it. It's kind of fun. Map.net. There you go, you can see, so this is sort of by um, country. So, you know, that's Google, right? That's, that's about what you'd expect. And this is live.com, which is a Microsoft thing. One of these is Wikipedia. Now check this out, Wikipedia is linked to by a lot of other countries. That's why it's kind of over the edges there. And then this stuff is uh, China. There's Baidu. There's Sina. No, the size is number of inlinks. But this is zoomable, so you can just sort of, you know, go in and look at all the smaller sites. And it's, um, you know, there's all of this stuff. Like, you know, this stuff has a lot of links to Travel Fusion. I have no idea what Travel Fusion is, but apparently 
this site links to it. Box Office India. Uh, I love this map because what I'm fascinated by is the stuff on the edges. So this stuff should all be things that link Chinese Americans by directory. Hmm. That sounds like it might be some sort of bridge node. There's a .cn site that's a bridge. There you go, there's big bridge. CN beta. Probably you find a China smack on here somewhere. Actually, let's look. Does anyone, is it .com? Does anyone remember? Yeah, there it is. Oh, actually, it looks like it links to mostly this blue stuff, which is... I don't know. US stuff. Anyway. Oh, no, China Snack is firmly embedded in the American space, so Chinese don't really read it. And then you've got this like purple stuff here, which is from Ghana. Anyway, so this is another way of sort of identifying uh, communities in terms of who connects to what through link structure. And that's another way that you could look at Twitter data. You could forget who tweeted it and just look at the links. Uh, well, actually, I think you want to look at, yeah, place people, make, make the nodes people, and place them close together if they link to similar things. There's all different types of ways you can, you can define this. There's ones that people don't think about. There exists now lo location trails for every user, right? So everyone who's carrying one of these, the telecommunications company, and I'll talk about this in the last one on surveillance and privacy, has a complete log of everywhere you've been down to uh, a dozen meters at you know minute intervals or so. So if you can track where everybody goes, you can see that a certain number of people end up at a particular club on Friday nights. That's a group of friends. Or you can see that people leave the campus and then go to the Starbucks, right? You there is now enough data to figure out who's in this class. You just look at you know who keeps going to EH two hundred one on Tuesday and Thursday nights. It's a way we don't normally think about, but you can you can generate communities out of location data as well. So that was just a detour to try to get you thinking. Communities is not just social network ties. It's all of these different ways you can associate people's together if you have the data. This is, um, here I'll actually show you the whole thing. Visosphere, here you go. This is, you know, sort of purports to be a visualization of the visualization community on Twitter. <laughs> I know, right? So that's navel gazing. Um, and I recognize a lot of these people and websites. I, I know most of them. I follow many of them. I'm, I'm on there somewhere. Oh, Ken Elliott. That's a nice to work with the AP. There you go. Um, Math Diva, who organizes hackers. Moritz Stefaner, who made this. Stain and Design, who some of you know. Ben Fry, who invented the processing language. Went on to Media Lab. But tricky. Anyway. Um, it claims that it's a visualization of visualization community. Um, so here's a question. How did they choose which nodes appear on the track? So this is how they did it. For a subjective selection of seed accounts, the Twitter API was queried for followers and friends. In order to be concluded onto a map, the user account needed to have at least five links, i.e. follower being followed to one of these accounts. The size of the network node indicates the number of followers within this network. And C accounts were a bunch of people. So they started with that list of accounts and they sort of spread outwards. It said anybody who has five, you know, follows five of them or is followed by five of them, it's on this map. Is this the visualization community? an opinion on whether or not this is a representation of the visualization community? 
not in absolute terms. What, in what way is this not a visualization of the visualization? Yeah. They might not even be on Twitter. Uh, even, even if they are on Twitter, they might not be connected, right? They might be like, like three links over there. It's a visualization community. Um, visualization is very multidisciplinary. This is sort of the new media, art, and design visualization community, I guess, um, in you know, English language speaking. But it's got a long history in computer science for scientific visualization. There's a conference every year called VisWeek, uh, which these people don't overlap with particularly. It's mostly academics and scientists and things. The point I'm trying to make is every time you draw a picture of a bunch of people, you are implicitly or explicitly making a choice about who is on that diagram. Uh, because otherwise you would have 7 billion people on the diagram. So if you change your criteria, you will change the structure that you see. For example, and in fact we had this earlier, oh that's hilarious, up and down work, it slides in different directions. So I can slide down and go to the next one, or I can slide right and go to the next one. It's a, quite a piece of UI. So here, at right, these book sales, they look like they're in three chunks. If I change my criteria, there's some threshold which decides whether Amazon says bought X, also bought Y. If I change that threshold, maybe these connect. Or maybe they don't. Or if I change the threshold, maybe all of them connect. Maybe what I'm looking at is, is only a little part. So, so there's this definition of what counts as a political book. Maybe if I expand the definition of a political book, you know, the definition of political is a funny thing. This is talking about elections and sort of recognizable politics. But if I talk about environmental policy or financial regulation or uh, freedom of speech or many of these things that are political issues but are not traditional politics, maybe what happens is that these little, these two little clusters turn out to be embedded in a much larger structure and then actually maybe that much larger structure actually you know has these three other parts that are much bigger and that's really the division of political books so it all depends on your framing uh, just as a, as a warning and there's there's editorial choice here in terms of what's in and what's out. Very often you have to pick thresholds for links. And if you make different choices, you will get different visualizations. So does that mean, what, what does that mean in terms of stories? What happens if you're trying to do a visualization of uh, the Chinese banking industry and you find that making a different you know, categorizing people as in or out of that industry in different ways gives you a different story. Or maybe you get two different data sets that give you a different story. What do you do? No, I'm seriously asking you guys, what would you do? Yeah, so that the fact that you see different things may actually be a real part of reality, maybe part of the story. Or it could be purely an artifact, right? If you're if you're picking arbitrary thresholds or are you know, um, in one way or another. And we all do this, right? It's like, let's try this visualization with 0.5. Well, that didn't look good. Let's try it with 0.6. Oh, there we go. Uh, but if your results are very sensitive to these types of choices, then you may not have a story. This is the idea of robustness that we talked about when, because remember, this is another place where we had editorial choice, was the choice of distance metrics and um, uh, feature encodings, right? How constructor feature vectors. And so it's the same problem. You have an issue where 
if you try it a lot of different ways and from a lot of different point of views and you get the same answer, that's a good sign. If you try a different technique and you get a different answer, well, then you gotta dig a little deeper. But I want I want to get you away from the idea that just because it's an algorithm, it's objective. There's a ton of choice here. This guy could have picked different seed accounts. He could have done it by looking at academic literature and published papers. He could have done it by uh, a, a snowball sampling, which is you go to three people that you know work in visualization, say in, in China, and you say, tell me all the names and email addresses of your friends. And then you send an email to those and say, tell me all of your friends who work in visualization. And eventually what happens is the set closes, right? You stop getting any new names. Uh, you could do that. Hell, you could even write an a automated program to do that, to automate sending emails and doing snowball sampling. Lots of different ways you could get the data, and you'll get different answers depending on where you look. There's no one visualization community. There's a there's a fantastic quote uh, from a, a mid 20th century century sociologist called Raymond Williams. The quote is: "There are no masses." There are only ways of seeing people as masses. Okay, so now with that, that deepness. Um, so I'm talking about you know finding clusters and all these things. Um, so how do you find clusters? Well, you kind of already know this because we've talked about it a lot. The difference with the work that we've done is in that one, we had a distance metric that could compare any two items. Here, uh, one way to think about it is the distance between two people who don't, or two items that don't have an edge is infinite. So it, the algorithms are a little bit different. Uh, and a little more specialized. So I'm gonna talk about one uh, that's very popular. You'll find it in Gephi which is the program they'll be using for your homework, and I think it's probably the best network or visualization and analysis tool. And this is a definition of a group. This is a, this is, what it does is it takes one graph and it tries to cut it into two pieces. And it says, these two are different groups if there are more edges going inside the groups than there are going between them. And what it does is it tries sort of all possible ways of putting them on two sides of a line and says, well, give me the one that gives me the most number of edges inside the groups and the fewest between them. And how it does that is it compares a random graph as a baseline. So a random graph is, I have these, I have this set of people. Now I'm going, and I know that I have in total, you know, 45 edges between them. I'm going to add 45 random edges. I'm going to pick random person A, random person B, and add an edge. And so a random graph, a random graph doesn't look like this. A random graph looks like, uh, let's see if we can find a random graph. Yeah, that's a random graph. That's a random graph. Um, you know, kind of. Here, here's one way to sort of think of a random graph: is it? It sort of. It doesn't really have any any structure to it. There's not really any good way to to break it up. There you go. Um, but if it's actually a community, then there's a way to break it into two. So here we go, we're gonna count. Formulas, okay, so some basic stuff. N is just the number of vertices. Um, K, I don't know why they use K in the original paper, but K is just the degree. Um, everyone remember what degree is? We talked about it earlier. What's the degree of a node? Number of edges, yeah, so it's just the number of other nodes it connects to. Um, AIJ is just this uh, matrix. It's also called the adjacency matrix. It's just got a one if there's an edge and a zero if they don't. 
It's just another way of writing a graph. You just put, you know, all of the nodes across and then all of the nodes down, and then you put a one if they have an edge and a zero if they don't. And it's symmetric for undirected graphs, so AIG equals AJ. And then we have this other variable, G, which is, um, that tells us, if, tells us if two nodes are in the same group or not. And we don't, the sort of point of the exercise is to compute G, so to figure out how to split them. But what we're going to do is first we're going to say, well, I'm going to derive a formula that tells me how good any possible splitting of this, these nodes into two communities is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find the split that, that maximizes that quality. So, all right. There is one half of the sum of ki total edges in the graph. Why do I have that half there? Yeah, otherwise I'd count every edge twice. Right. So, the, you know, the, the simplest example of that is if I have the two nodes, the one edge, this node has degree one, so k1 equals one. A2 equals 1. If I sum those together, I get 2, but there's only one edge. So i got to have that happen there. Um, now, if I take all of these edges, these M edges, and I put them between random nodes, then the, on average, the number of edges between nodes I and J is the, um, that. Um, what that formula says is if I've got a node which has very high degree and it goes to some other random things uh, and then I have another node which has you know some other degree kj the probability that I'm going to have a, a, I think that, that's actually the yeah, that ends up being the probability because I divide by two n. Sorry. So the, the more edges that come out of each node, the more likely it is to connect to any other particular node because it's got lots of edges. And then I divide by two to prevent counting twice, and I divide by m because I'm I want that to be a number between zero and one. So it's basically the probability that there's an edge between any two nodes. It only depends on how many edges each of them has because I'm placing them randomly. So then I define this horrible thing, sum of, okay, let's break this down. So first of all, I'm summing over ij, which means I sum over every possible pair. I ask for every pair of nodes. I'm going to either add some to the sum or not. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add it only if this g thing is 1, right? So I'm going to say, okay, for every, pos every pair of nodes that are in the same group, I'm going to add something. So only nodes, only edges between nodes in the same group get counted. And then the thing I'm going to do is this thing. So this is the difference between how many edges are actually there in the graph, so that's that AIG, minus how many I would have in a random graph. So if I sum over all of these, what I'm doing is I'm adding up the difference between the edges that I have minus the edges I would have randomly, but only for the edges inside the group. So if this thing ends up being positive, then what I've got is more edges inside a group than I would expect by chance. All right, so think of it this way. I have all of you people, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say you're in, on two teams. You're in team A and team B, except you're all scrambled. You're all sitting in random places. And I'm gonna say everybody in team A knows each other, and everybody in team B knows each other. But if you're in team A, you only know half of the people in B. But you're all scrambled, so I don't know who's A and B. What I want to find out is who is A and B. So what I do is I draw a line. I say, okay, I draw a line here. Say all of you are in one group. All of you are in another group. And then I'm going to count, and I, I know there's a certain number of edges, and I'm going to say, well, am I really doing better than 
just randomly assigning you to two different groups, right? Because if I just randomly assign you to two different groups and say, I'm going to randomly guess A or B for each one of you, then I'm going to have a certain number of edges inside the group and I'm going to have a certain number of edges between the groups. And I've got to do better than random because I'm trying to find the original groups, A and B. I'm, I'm assuming that there's some split of you where most of the people in A, or you know, everyone in A knows each other and everyone in B knows each other and then there's fewer links between the two. So that's why I have to compare to this, this random split. And so I'm doing, I'm saying for this split, I'm going to count the number for everybody that I've said is inside A. So for every pair of you who are inside the same group, I'm going to add a one. And then for every pair of you over here who are inside the same group who I've just put on this group, I'm going to add a one. But then I'm going to subtract off how many I would expect to see just because there's, you know, a hundred edges anyway. Does this, this make sense? You can't just count the edges inside and the edges outside because, for example, the splits don't, don't, don't have to be the same size, right? So maybe the best way to split them up is you've got 10 people here and three people here. And that's actually the way to split them up. And if I just count the number of edges that are inside each group, I compare it to the number of edges that are outside each group, well, that group's a lot bigger, so that's going to have a lot of edges inside. What I want to ask is, well, if I take these edges and I send them randomly, I send you know, randomly some fraction of them to the other group, how many do I expect just by chance? That's why I need this baseline. And also, if I have a lot more edges, then this number gets much bigger. But I want some number that, when it's greater than zero, it means I found a good split. And in fact, I want to make it as big as possible. So that's why I subtract off this random thing. So we look for this, right? We've got this, this Q thing. And it depends on, I get to choose this GIJ. That, that means I get to choose how I'm splitting it. And for every choice that I make, this, I can calculate this formula and it gives me a number. If I rearrange this, so in theory, now I have an algorithm. I, I try every possible partition of nodes. But if every node can be group A or B, there's now two to the n possible partitions. So that's exponential. So I don't actually try every partition and, and calculate this. Because that would be two to the n times n squared to run over those ij's. Very slow. It turns out, that once again, there's an eigenvector technique. You turn this into a matrix equation and you can use um, standard numerical software to, to give you the answer to find the division that maximizes that Q thing. So I do that. I do that and I say, okay, so breaking it like this is the best possible division. But sometimes there isn't a way to break it into two groups that gives you that Q greater than zero, right? So no matter how I try to split these up or arrange you in two different sides, I never get more edges inside each group than I would expect just by chance, given the number of edges that there are totally. And when that happens, it means I've only got one community. So this algorithm is, a, is an interesting algorithm because it doesn't always find a solution. It, it tells you by itself when to stop. It says, you know what, there's no way you can split these up that's better than having them together. And then I just keep breaking it. And so I just keep each chunk and I break it further. That chunk probably stays in here. So in the end I get, I guess, four pieces there. And there it is. This is actually um, another book, a set of uh, books on politics. And it's, it's found, uh, again, it sort of splits into four pieces. And you can kind of see it. Uh, and then the the... The dots or the shapes represent what the books are about, right? So this is liberal, this is conservative, and the triangles are the stuff in the middle. So you can see, like this community, it found it's got some stuff in the middle and then some of either type. Dolphins. I promised you dolphins.
Okay, this is a graph on, um, this is an amazing data set. This is dolphin social interactions collected over seven years. So this is divers watching, turns out, 62 dolphins. And every time two dolphins go next to each other and go, or whatever, whatever they're doing, right? Or they're, I'm not actually sure. I need to read the original paper to see what the criteria was. But it's divers with notebooks, first of all, learning to identify the dolphins because they have different sizes and sexes and they've got scars and they're, apparently you can identify them. Maybe they put tags on them. That's probably what they did. Um, looking at dolphin social interactions. And so the first thing we're going to do is just give it a, a layout. So I'm going to pick one of these force directed layouts. Boink. And then zoom in a little bit. Okay, so there's structure here. Not every dolphin plays with every other dolphin. Plays, mates, talks, I don't know, interacts with every other dolphin. Dolphins are social creatures, right? They're like us. But, but, but you know, not exactly like us. In fact, one of the things they did from a social network analysis of this is talk about how dolphins are and aren't like us because we tend to sort, we have homophily, we tend to be you know, similar age ranges. And there's not a lot of age range in this room. Uh, and dolphins also tend to do this, and also they tend to have groups that are slightly more of one sex than another. But to make those first sorts of statements, first you need to sort out communities. So how many communities of dolphins do you see here? Anyone want to guess? Yeah, two-ish. I think there might be slightly more. So I'm going to um, run this modularity algorithm. Run modularity. Uh, and it, yeah, I'm going to ignore that. It just tells me how big each, each chunk is. And then what I can do is modularity class apply. There you go. So it's actually given us one, two, three, four, five. It's saying there are basically five. It's a little hard to see, but this stuff here is like almost black, and then this stuff is black. So it's actually it's actually five. Is what this algorithm applied to this graph gives, and because uh, what it's saying is this lighter gray stuff. If I draw a line that splits it from this darker gray stuff, I see a lot more edges inside each color. Than I would expect if you know they all play together randomly. Uh, so there you go. So you apply this algorithm, and I mean I think the algorithm is useful when you sort of don't know where to start, right? It's like, well, what does this mean? Um, in this case, you know, you have to analyze dolphin social groups in some way if you want to do any sort of quantitative work on that, and you can compare it to applying the same algorithm to human social groups. Now, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right way to split up dolphins into communities, but it's a way. There are other community detection algorithms. Um, one of the nice things about this algorithm, I will say, is that it has no parameters. Unlike a clustering algorithm where you have to say, well, there's some distance threshold, and then the clusters go, and then you can change the threshold, there's no such choice in this algorithm, which, you know, at least you don't have to make an arbitrary decision in that sense. So it's it's something. Anyway, now we've got, looked at the social network of dolphins. I think in practice you're going to be doing this much more by uh, eyeballing it. Um, or generating communities in other ways, like the way the visualization community graph is generated with seed accounts and then sampling out. Or, um, you know, a very obvious one is connected components. Uh, so in the um, case, case of here, right, there are some sort of weak bridges between my friends, but then there's also this chunk where there's no connection. 
and that, that's called a connected component. And then, of course, there's this bit and these ones floating off. So there's actually one main one and then one, two, three, four other ones. So this has five components. And you're very often going to see this, and that, that's a pretty good indicator. You're, you're, you're going to find pretty quickly that, like, say you take all Weibo that contains some word, you're going to find a bunch of chunks, and those are going to be your communities, or you're going to do visualization. But if you ever need to have an algorithmic technique to separate things into communities, uh, this. And um, there's a lot of variations. Yeah, exactly. Because the thing is, because the force layout technique is is optimizing for a different thing, right? It's it's taking into account you know all the links and it's doing the spring thing and whatever. It's drawing a picture, but you can make different pictures, right? So I can do um, here's another way of generating a picture, which apparently makes a bigger picture. Um, Now I can't get it to not use the color. I don't know, maybe you can see that there's sort of four groups there. But it depends how you draw them, right? Because I can I can just drag these around. I think I can. There we go. Right, I can I can just drag these around and, and put them anywhere I want. And you know how what layout algorithm you use will give you a different impression of what the graph looks like. There's actually research on that. You can lay out the same graph in different ways, and people see different things. So eyeballing it isn't always the answer. Sometimes you want an algorithmic technique, or the graph is just too big, and you need some way to split it up into smaller pieces to begin your analysis. Also, people are going to tell you about this. You know, you're going to be a journalist and you're going to talk about the story and doing network, network analysis. And some mathematician is going to come up and say, why didn't you use modularity? And you're going to say, because it didn't model the thing that I wanted to look at, and why is modularity necessarily the right thing? But, you know, again, it's another technique, right? It's another check. You can try using modularity and eyeballing it and see if they agree. Anyways, modularity. Um, one more algorithmic technique, and then we're going to talk about some more general issues. This is kind of a kind of a combination between a centrality and a uh, community algorithm. It breaks the graph into chunks and assigns different sets. But what it does is it tries to say these are the outermost people, and these are more inner, and more inner, and more inner. Um, and it's very simple. All you do is you start with all of the nodes that have degree one, uh, and you, they're the they're the one core, and then you remove all of those, and everything that's left is the two core, and then you remove all of those, and everything that's left is the three core. Um, it's got one slight thing, which is you have to keep removing. Um, so if I, well, let, let's look at a picture. This will be more clear. So all of these nodes out here. Now notice they don't all all have degree one, but I have this step repeat until all remaining nodes have degree greater than equal k, right? So when I set um, k equals two, it of course removes this one and this one and uh, and this one because they only have degree one. But then this one because I removed the things outside, it now only has degree one. So I remove that as well on the next pass. And then all of this green stuff and all of the red stuff inside of it, um, it stays stable. Everything there has degree at least two, so I stop removing things. So I keep removing edges of every node that has degree less than k until I have nothing more to remove. Reasonably clear, I hope. Not very hard. And you do this for big networks and you get some interesting stuff. This is a this is a map of the internet. But this is not a map of the logical internet, that is websites. This is a map of the physical internet. Each of these uh, dots is uh, an internet host. 
it is uh, so how the internet works at a, a, a lower level is it self configures routing packets between different switches, different big computers that switch information um, using something called the border gateway protocol. And so, like, you know, this is ATT's New York data center. This is the Egyptian telecommunication ministry. This is uh, uh, a local ISP in Finland. And so this is the core number on the side here. And so you remove every, every, uh, every computer that only connects to one other computer. That's this stuff out here, the one core. And then you start the you know, computers that connect to four other, and so on and so on. You get to the middle, and you get these massive ones in the middle that connect to 30 or 40 other computers. And so it, it's a centrality measure, but it gives you sets. You can think of it as concentric rings. So that's why it's called K-core or K-shell. And the thing about uh, K-shell is, unlike almost all, all of the other centrality measures that we have looked at, where the interpretation was sort of loose and there's a sort of idea of what it might be modeling, there's actually very strong evidence that this models something real in a sense. Uh, this is very good for predicting who is going to be good at spreading information. So this I, so influences the idea of, of information cascades. I tweet something and then other people retweet it. I buy something and then other people buy it. And this, this measure turns out to be strongly correlated with measurements of influence, uh, both theoretically and in practice, uh, which is kind of an achievement that we can write a paper about what, what about someone's position in a network makes them influential from a purely mathematical structural analysis and then match it up with real world data. This is a study, um, which is a great study. I think this is the best social network analysis study I've seen. In Spain, uh, in May of 2011, there were a series of protests uh, about the actions of the government, uh, protesting austerity measures and such, uh, culminating in a protest on May 20th, which is here marked, or sorry, 15, um, which is here marked at zero. Uh, and, you know, starting couple weeks before that and going a couple weeks after that, um, leading up to the elections. This is a graph. This is a, a cumulative graph. So this is, what they did is they recorded everybody who ever tweeted with a particular hashtag. And this is how many of the people who ever tweeted with that hashtag had done it by this time. And so what they said is this showed protest recruitment. Now, it doesn't quite show protest recruitment because maybe someone tweets really early and then they never tweet again. But if you assume that once they start tweeting, they keep tweeting, that's kind of the assumption here. And you can see it lines up with various events. You know, it, the first mass demonstration, and then it really takes off, and then the police start fighting back, and it goes up and up and up. But then, of course, after the election, it's really, there's nothing more to do, and it trails off. But the slope, of course, is how fast people are joining. One of the questions they asked is, was there a way to predict whose tweets would get amplified? Who was good at starting what they called cascades, where one person tweets something and then many other people retweet it and retweet it and it spreads through. And what they found was that the K-shell decomposition was a good predictor. Not a totally strong predictor, but a good one. So what's going on here is they're arranged in these concentric rings here according to the shell decomposition. And then this color is uh, NC over N. N is the number of people. It's a, a few tens of thousands. NC is the number, the size of the largest cascade that they started. And so the bright orange nodes are the people who had the, the, the tweet, which was retweeted the most times. And uh, generally, they're near, they're in the center core. They're really, they're in this, this center chunk here. You don't see much of them in the outside mm -hmm. chunks. And you can, you, know, you can plot this out as a graph, and you see a fairly uh, clear correlation. So I thought that algorithm was kind of cool, because it's, it's one of the only centrality measures that has some grounding in empirical measurements. And maybe it will be useful to you. 
the last thing we're going to do is talk about what this looks like when people actually do journalism with it. So we're going to look at some stories. Uh, you already saw the video on the, the human tissue thing and the Galleons web thing. There was a project here called Who Runs Hong Kong uh, at the SCMP, uh, which is uh, now offline, I believe, and has been for a while. But it was kind of interesting. It was fairly classic stuff. So um, let's see, do we have time here? We don't really have time. I'm going to show you Muckety instead, which is sort of a, a, a not offline version of the same thing. Muckety. Here's what it looks like. What they do is they collect link information. Um, all types of relationships between people served on the board with, went to school with, uh, you know, was a campaign con contributor. They just suck in information. And then they can do stories like, um, like this one. Um, so here is um, this woman who was just nominated to head the Security Exchange Commission, which oversees financial stock market stuff in the US. And so there she is in the center, and then she's got all these links, you know. The dash means she used to be, solid means currently. So, you know, married to this guy, used to be a lawyer for them, used to be a director of NASDAQ. And you can see, you know, attorney for Kenneth Lewis, who was a fundraiser for Obama. So you can see immediately that through a couple indirect connections, she's, you know, she's definitely sort of in the the president's circle there. And then any one of these, this is an event, World Trade Center bombing. Oh, wow, she prosecuted this guy who wrote the World Trader in 793. And then if I go um, expand, this is going to get us into a completely different territory here. But I see other people who are connected to that incident. So Muckety has tons of this stuff. And if I try to run social network analysis on this, like centrality or something, uh, it's just going to be a mess because prosecuted is a very different relationship than partner. And so if I just look at the links, it's not really going to make any sense. But in principle, uh, this is an amazing tool for understanding the structure of the world that we live in. Right. I don't know who funds it actually, um, but it's just called Muckety, it's just muckety.com. Let's see. Search help about. I think what they do is they provide data services as how they make their money. So, you know, people who need this for research in some sort. Favorites. Oh, yeah. Remember this, the director of the CIA caught having this affair? It was a complicated story. So here's the pieces of it. Yeah, so check it out. They've got events, they've got organizations, they've got people, they've got biographer had an affair with. There's a unique relationship. <laughs> so, so this is this is a really good example, right? If if you want to describe the world in terms of links, you have to say what types of links there are. And it looks like what they allow is sort of free-form entry, which I think is what you want. Eventually, this evolves from, you know, friended on Facebook or retweeted into arbitrarily complicated relationships which you can describe in human language. And then when you do the analysis of it, at this stage it's much, much less about the algorithms for going over large amounts of data than it is about essentially being a sort of reporter's notebook. So we're kind of coming all the way back to the detective movie where you have the names and the photographs and the places and the string between those. That's really what we're emulating here. The difference is there is the potential to suck in incredible amounts of information. So let's see what's under new data. Well, I, I don't know if they're entering all of this manually. I mean, they must be doing things like um, you know, campaign contributions. But in theory, this type of database, much more so than a uh, relational database or any sort of tabular database, is sort of the, 
the end all data store, right? You can represent any type of relation in this type of database. And that's actually a really good segue into the next lecture, which is going to be about knowledge representation. So Makadi, um, yeah, so these are the examples we saw, right? You get, we had this for the tissue trade, this sort of web of companies. And then the insider trading thing um, is actually a nice little video that they made for Who Runs Hong Kong, which was talked about the fight over this guy's billions uh, within his family and all of the shell companies that he used. And it was pretty cool. Uh, so in there, the, the graph is used to illustrate the story. I don't know if when the reporters were working on the story, they actually used it to discover it or not. And then Makadi, which we just looked at. I want to end with some things that you could use in journalism, but I haven't seen anybody do yet. This is the most central, uh, I think there's a thousand or so multinationals with about 140 really in the center. In t uh, as of 2007, when they got this data, uh, in terms of corporate ownership. So what they've done here is there's an, an edge means that this company owns 51% of that company. Or it might not be 51%, it's some fraction that they said. Right? And what they're looking for is these sorts of interlocking ownership structures. So you can see that a lot of the big financial companies actually own large parts of other companies. And the, in the paper, they go into some implications for corporate accountability and stability of the financial system. Um, you don't want, you probably don't want this much interlocking for financial stability because you know if AXA goes down, it probably pulls down Merrill Lynch, it pulls down State Street, it pulls down Bank of America, which is of course exactly what happened. One of the things that I find kind of interesting is they talk a bit about the shape of the graph. This is a directed graph because uh, ownership goes one way, not both ways. And so you've got all this sort of the, the in funnel, which is um, goes into the central component, right? So it's a strongly connected component. That means you can go from any node to any other via some arrow. So, you know, this company owns some fraction of that company and vice versa via some path. And so there's this central strongly connected component, which is a term from graph theory. And then there's stuff which goes into it. You know, so these are the companies that own some part of the companies in here, and then they own all of this stuff. And then there's a little bit of, um, they call them tubes and tendrils. You know, a few things that bypass the ownership structure. And then, anyway, so it's a, it's a nice sort of description of what, what you get when you do a big analysis on directed as opposed to undirected graphs. We haven't really talked about directed graphs. I would like to see this for other industries or politics. I would, um, you know, I showed this to a bunch of people and asked, you know, what does it really tell us? I mean, yes, obviously a small number of large corporations have most of the resources in the world. I mean, we knew that. So in that sense, not a story. But is there anything we can learn from this? I mean, is this interesting? What do we do? What do we do with it? I've heard two really good answers now. One is you do this every year, and you watch how it changes. You learn who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down. You also learn about whether control is getting more or less concentrated, which I think is a, that's important. You want to watch that. Uh, it's usually a bad sign when, when wealth and power are being concentrated. The other one is I want to use this as sort of a filtering mechanism, right? So let's, we've now identified 140 odd country, companies that are really at the center of this ownership, right? So this is a particular type of centrality metric, metric again, right? We're talking about the center strongly connected component and then the center of that. I'm not sure what metric they use to make pick these red ones, but it's some metric. So now, Let's do an investigative series. Let's compile like a dossier, you know, like a like a wiki page. You know, the hundred most central companies in the world, which are not necessarily going to be the largest or most popular. This is a different way of picking them. You know, Fortune does this list. You know, the Fortune 500, and that's ranked by capitalization. 
maybe capitalization is interesting. Maybe ranking by ownership is interesting. So to me, the other really interesting thing you can do with this, or this type of thing, which you could apply to you know, politicians or power structures generally, is to tell you who you should be watching. Because maybe you've never heard of, well, all these you've heard of, but maybe you've never heard of this guy. Well, what industry is that company in? And what are they doing? They're powerful. In as much as the job of journalism is to keep track of what powerful people are doing, this is a way to answer the question, who are the powerful people? So that, I think, is interesting. And then you can track information spread. You all remember Coney 2012? This is social flows visualization of how it spread. And you can see there's some, some really tightly packed networks, uh, especially right around the center here, where, that, uh, where Invisible Children is. Uh, and they do an analysis of who these people are and what type of person. It turns out to be a lot of Christian youth. Uh, and talk about how that message was amplified so quickly. And they did this for Bin Laden as well. But this one has a much more complicated and interesting network structure. So we could ask questions about how does our information as journalists spread, or how does propaganda spread, right? What, what uh, you could do this type of analysis in the Chinese media system and ask where do certain ideas come from. So um, I showed you a bunch of algorithms, but the message is kind of. You know, the first tool you reach for should probably be visualization. And there's good tools for that, like uh, this one, the Dolphin Viewer. Uh, it's called Gephi. It's free. Um, algorithmic solutions are really, nobody's done it yet. Uh, if you find a good uh, use for it, uh, if you do a good story with it, I'd, I'd love to know. Uh, and I think, basically, that's just a matter of time in terms of scaling up from uh, you know, this size and that size of graph to this size and that size of graph. I think it's really just a matter of time. Uh, and then the last thing I want to leave you with is uh, I'm. This is filtering in reverse. You know, so we looked at filtering the last two classes for. I'm the audience member, and I want uh, a system that brings me certain types of information. So now I'm going to say, well, actually, I'm the journalist, and I want to get my story to a certain community. Right? So when I did that work on uh, security contractors in Iraq, I know that not very many people read it. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a hit story. It didn't have a lot of retweets. But I also know from talking to other people that people in the international human rights community did read it. So I could ask the question, can I use community detection techniques to figure out who the international human rights community is, who's influential in that, and then tweet at a handful of people and say, here, this, this is this story, and hope that they will spread it throughout that community quickly. So I may be able to use this to target audiences. And of course, marketers and politicians are already doing this, and there's no reason why journalists shouldn't be doing this as well. That is uh, the lecture. Um, you have an assignment, which is um, somewhere. Right here. There we go. Uh, it's basically to do a social network analysis with Gephi. And what you're going to do is you're going to compare three different centrality measures uh, on the Lemiz network. And you're going to explain to me what each of them is telling you. So I hope that you're all familiar with the plot of that story because it'll really help with the interpretation. All right? All right, thank you.